من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومه ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وآمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا أما بعد We are trying to tackle the existential issues, philosophical issues uh, by, you know, modern standards. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create death and life, testing and trials, difficulties and hardships? Why? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this life in this fashion, in this way? And we gave the general answer last time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made death the end of the trouble for the believer. All the trouble you are having will finish the minute you go to the other world. Inshallah. Keep working, keep praying, keep studying, keep reading the Quran, keep doing the right thing. Keep being a loving, compassionate Muslim. Keep your line with Allah a straight line, which is called the straight path. Do not get anyone between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once you go, He will receive you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will receive you by sending His angels. The angels will be waiting for you, telling you, this is the day of yours that you have been promised. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it an easy day. The Prophet وسلم, says that the, the soul of the believer, when it is taken out of his or her body, will be like a piece of cloth that is made of silk, being drawn over a piece of another silk. And the soul of the disbeliever and the rebellious people who deny Allah or challenge his power and authority or disobey his commands, this soul will be drawn like a piece of silk drawn over a foundation of thorns. If you could imagine nails or thorns or anything like this, it's going to be difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our life Submissive and our death easy. <coughs> we also mentioned that it is Allah who did not only create us and gave us life, we mentioned that He created us from nothing. From nothing. And then that nothing turned out to be dust. What is dust? What is dust that you walk on? the dust of the earth or any type of dust, it's nothing. لم يكن شيئاً مذكورة. So when you see yourself able to do things because of the capacities and the faculties Allah has given you, it should humble us. It should humble us. It should make us really submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Walking with humility, living with humility, interacting with life and living things and anything with humility. Some people, when they have power, they think they are gods or like gods. But Allah never... <coughs> Excuse me. Allah never relinquished His Lordship. He is the Lord. He is in charge. So... People who think that they are gods because they have money or that they have power or they have authority or they have followers, they are deluding themselves. 
they are cheating themselves out of the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us in the Quran that this life is a constant journey. Whether you are asleep or awake, you are on your way back to Allah. It's a journey, rihla. It starts when you are born, it ends when you die. It's that simple. It is not complicated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna dhalika ala Allah yaseer. He also says, Wallahu ala kulli shay'in qadir. He is capable over everything. He says, Wallahu ghalibun ala amrih. His will will be done no matter what. So all of these ayat are meant to tell us accept his qadr whether you think it's good or you think it's bad whether you think it's pleasant or difficult accept it because you have no other god but him and he also broke from our hands broke away took away from our hands the power to control things we would love to control everybody wants to control when it gets tight, he wants to have the means to break away from that tightness. When it is difficult, to solve your issues. But that's not his plan. His plan is, you have limited power, he has unlimited absolute power. So the one who has limited power has to go and resort and ask and submit to the one who has unlimited absolute power which means your power is not enough and he showed us physically in life that no matter how capable you are you have nothing no matter how powerful you are you are helpless without his approval of what you want to do you can never get anything your way so all of these ayat are telling us one thing and one thing only. You are a servant in his kingdom. You are a guest amongst other creations that are here also as guests, creatures of his. And every creature does his will without a choice except the humans and jinn. We are the only two types of creatures who have the free will to obey or not obey, to believe or to disbelieve, to submit or to be renegades. You have a choice. As, as a Muslim, you know your choice. So the point here is, death should never be shocking surprise. He died. He was only five years old. He was 27. MashaAllah, he was very active, he was doing great things. That's okay. Good people die and bad people die. <laughs> Young people die and old people die. Healthy people die and sick people die. Wealthy people die and poor people die. Kullu nafsin dha'iqatul maut. Every soul will taste death. So death is meant to force our hands, our spiritual hands, to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we say spiritual, we need to pay attention. We are tying our spirit to what we're doing, which means we assume that our spirit is our greatest motive. Why is the spirit? Because the spirit is our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our connection with Allah is when he blew, as he says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Allah told the angels, once I format this creature, which he is referring to Adam, 
made out of clay or mud or dust or water, all of this is correct. And then he says, once I shape him, once I format him, and I blew into him from the spirit I created. The word min ruhi, it doesn't mean that it is his soul and then he is blowing it into us. It is his soul by possession, not by physical assumption. Like this universe is his. It doesn't mean that he is part of the universe. And it doesn't mean that the universe which he created is part of his being. No, it is his creature. The spirit is also part of his creatures. So when we say that so and so seems to be a spiritual person, it means we are referring to the spirit which is the connection between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once that spirit travels out of the body, right, everything is gone. There is no soul, because the soul is the byproduct of the, the spirit joining the body. Once that spirit joins the body, the body is a life. It becomes a living being. And the word nafs, which is translated into soul, is to signify the breath, the first breath that you take, right? It also can signify the last breath you take. When the spirit is taken out, the soul dies. Allahu yatawaffa al-anfusa hina mawtiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put to end the souls once the person dies. What is death? The exit of the spirit out of the body. But so long as the spirit is in the body, the person is alive. So Allah has control over death and life. And he did, he did not hide this from us. He told us, everybody is dying. You, Muhammad, are dying. And they are also dying. Everybody will die. إِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ you are dying. That's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So nobody should look at death with a sense of shocking or surprise or anything else. We should look at death as the journey of that person is finished. His time is up. His term is over. It's finished. And that term is only under the control of the divine hands. He is the only one who knows when everybody's time is over. So, so we answered that as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us from nothing or from turab, dust, or teen, which is mud, water, and dust, right? He is telling us that he created us this way and he will bring us back to life after dying. He told us, Minha khalaqnakum, from it we have created you. Wa fiha nu'idukum, then we will return you back into it, the earth. Wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. And from it, we are going to create you or to bring you up again, raise you up again, another, one more time. So you have two deaths and two lives. You start from dust, which is a non-living material, right? And then w when you die, your body dis uh, integrate into the dust and it disappears. You don't see a body and a dust, it all turns into dust. So that we see with our own eyes what the Quran is saying. And when the mushrikeen asked, who is going to bring those decayed bones again after they have decayed and decomposed? Allah says, قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً 
the one who gave it life the first time is the one who is going to resurrect it and raise it up again. So we need to understand death in this context. Death and the life after death until resurrection is only a bridge between this life and the following life. For the believer, death is the end of trouble. No matter how much trouble you may have in this life. Some people say we have it tough. No matter how tough it may be compared to the, the difficulties that a disbeliever would face in the hereafter, you have nothing. And no matter how pleasant and joyful and happy and funny the life of a disbeliever in this life may be, the trouble awaiting him far exceeds. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ tells us that on the Day of Judgment, they will bring a person who had very tough life here. But he lived by the code, he lived by the book, he lived by the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his place in the end is paradise. And they will ask him, oh, do you remember how much trouble and difficulties you've had, how much suffering and pain and trials and tests? He would say, no Allah, I never saw anything tough. It was so pleasant. So the pleasure of paradise, once you enter, just enter, it will make you forget all the trouble you have here. So Allah is giving us a comparative picture and image and sense of recognition of what we have here and what we may face over there. Whether the person gets to paradise, may Allah make us among the people of paradise, or he gets somewhere else. We have to live with that sense. Our hope is that Allah will make death the end of our trouble. May Allah make the death the end of our trouble and the beginning of our pleasure. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the sense of the extended concept of the two lives. This life which is very short and the other life which is called eternal life khalidina fiha they are there forever allahumma ja'alna min ahl al-jannah allahumma ja'alna min ahl al-jannah so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also declared for us that the spirit which is the point of connection between us and allah has to be fed to keep alive. Its food is to be a spiritual person, a person who is conscientious of the needs of his or her spirit. Your spirit needs food, it needs water, it needs sources that can give it continuous life. On what does it live? It lives on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As it is created by the word of Allah and it is gifted into your body as a trust, it is not your possession, it is not your property, you cannot take out your own life. And at the same time, as we feed the body, we must feed the spirit. As we want to satisfy our basic needs, satisfy ourselves, and our desires, we also need to control ourselves so that our desires do not control us. The soul is a two-faced type of creature that is blown into you with your spirit. When, when the soul, when the spirit and the body are integrated when the soul, the spirit enters the body, your soul starts life. So you need to feed your spirit and you need to control yourself. 
you need to trim the excesses of yourself because if you follow your desires you end up becoming a slave to yourself and hence we are all suffering partially or completely from the most and worst form of shirk which is self worship obeying yourself which the quran says واتبع هواه ولا تطع من اغفلنا قلبه عن ذكرنا واتبع هواه do not obey someone who follows his own whims and desires whatever I feel like I want to do and by the way our children who go to public schools in particular are being bombarded by self-worship incentives if you do not protect yourself nobody can protect you Allah says no your parents should protect you your extended family should protect you your neighbors should protect you you are not alone here Allah is the ultimate protector so you are not here as another God you are here as a helpless human being that Allah has given limited capacities limited faculties so that you can manage your life you are not so don't take yourself as a God but here people are told you are in charge of pushing everything against you and grabbing anything that you can that creates monsters and that's why kids by the age of 10 are not easy to manage or direct or guide they are not because they have been bombarded with the idea that you are your own God it is not said in the same words but if they tell you your parents cannot force you to do this what does this mean? that parents have no authority when they institute regulations and rules in the school system that excludes parents from having a say over their own kids in serious matters that is exclusion of authority when parents lose authority and the society loses authority and the political system loses authority like the case when we are now right then we are nurturing that every human being is a loose cannon call it God call it monster loose cannon there is no control so what happens then everybody picks their gun and they want to fight everybody else who says anything different that's not the Islamic way the Islamic way is we are all here to serve Allah we are all here to serve each other and to support each other and to love each other we have made you into peoples and tribes so that you may get to know respect understand and appreciate and help each other that's the purpose we are not here to fight over the zero which this life is this life compared to the hereafter is a small zero not big fat zero the small zero and that's where our fights are all about we're fighting on a piece of land or a piece of power or anything else this is ridiculous and it is counterintuitive because the more you fight for what you want the more others will fight back for what they want to defend or grab so fighting nurtures fighting but peace and love nurture peace and love may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us loving Muslims who love Allah who love his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who love his book and his word who love to live by his book learn it, recite it teach it and convey the message to everybody 
a message of love, care, and compassion. Allahumma amin. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa man wala. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik alayhi wa ala sahabati wa man ittaba' sunnatahu bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. In surat al-hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us one long ayah, ayah number five in the beginning of the surah. And I'm not going to go over the whole thing because we don't have enough time to do that. But I want to just pick one, two words in the ayah. Ya ayyuhal nas, in kuntum fi raybin min al-ba'ath, fa inna khalaqnakum min turab, thumma min nutfa, thumma min alaqa, thumma min mudgatin, mukhallaqatin, wa ghayri mukhallaqatin, linubayyina lakum. O mankind, if you have any doubt that you will not be resurrected, we have created you from dust. The dust you end up going to become is where you originally came from. And then from nutfa. Nutfa is the mix of the sperm of the man and the egg of the woman. Thumma min alaqa, something that clings to the uh, wall of the womb of the mother, thumma min mudra. It is a chewed type of meat or chewed like type of meat, formed and unformed. Muhallakatin wa ghayri muhallaka, shaped or unshaped. And then Allah says, Linubayyina lakum. What does this part mean? To show you. To clarify for you. What is Allah clarifying for us? Remember, Al-Hajj is a journey. Life is a journey. It has a beginning, it has an end. This is Surah Al-Hajj. Right? Al-Hajj also is a journey that comes with a purpose. Qasd al-bayt al-haram biniyat al-hajj. Al-ibadah. So our journey in this life is similar to that. You have to have your intention fresh and clear every day. Renew your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, what does Allah clarify here that he refers to as لِنُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ Several things. Number one, لِنُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ From where did you come? Your first father, Adam, came from dust, and the rest came as children who grew up in the wombs of their mothers. And he is giving us the details of the stages that we go through to show us that not only did he create us like this, but he cared for us from the beginning of fertilization until your birth. And after. So he's saying, you are, you are precious to me. I personally created you with my hand. Lima khalaqtu biyadayya. Allah says to Iblis, why don't you prostrate to the one that I created with my own hands? He's showing us a lot of love, a lot of care so that we love him back. And he created everything for us so that we appreciate that and be grateful. That's a show of our loving him back. Also, he wants to clear for us and clarify for us that he is in control. As he controlled our life, our development in the mother's womb, he is in control of our life even after we become the strong being we become. It is all temporary. It's all short. What else does Allah want to clarify for us? He wants to clarify for us that it is all up to him. He can disrupt 
anything at any time. So he goes on to say, ونقر في الأرحام ما نشاء. We let live in the wombs whatever and whomever we want. Which means what? It's up to him. He's in control. So your birth and creation is not an eventuality that is supported by nature. It is all in the hands of Allah. One step at a time. One minute at a time. One second at a time. And how many babies die in the wombs of their mothers? We know. It's unlimited. Nobody could put a count on it. So, وَنُقِرُّ فِي الْأَرْحَامِ We let live some fetuses to grow as full infants and children in the womb of their mother. But only up to a specific term. إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Then what? ثُمَّ نُخْرِجُكُمْ طِفْلًا Then we get you out as a child. ثُمَّ السَّبِيلَ يَسَّرَى a couple of days ago, a sister called, asking, I am pregnant, about maybe 30 some weeks, and uh, the doctor is saying that the baby's head is a bit large. And I'm asking if I am allowed to abort the baby. And I said, and why do you want to abort it? Some babies' heads are bigger than others. Unless there is something unusual. But a big head is a big head. But Allah is the one who makes it easy to come out of the womb. The baby does not get itself out. The baby does not get itself out. Allah makes it easy for the baby to come out. So he goes on to say, ثُمَّ لِتَبْلُغُوا أَشُدَّكُمْ Then you reach your full strength. Every step of the way, he is in charge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the love of the Qur'an and the love of living the Qur'an and understanding of the Qur'an. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول بي بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون بي علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا اللهم أحينا مسلمين وتوفنا مسلمين وألحقنا بالصالحين واغفر لنا ولأهوالدينا وللمسلمين أجمعين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة